All right. Final chapter, and it's about special senses. Okay, so when I was growing up, I used to think special senses were, um, you know, the five what we call primary senses. All right, sight or, or vision, hearing, touch, taste, smell. Okay, and so we've added a couple other things into that list here. So when we talk about the special senses, we're going to talk about the sensory portion of your nervous system. All right, that's going to be the input that's coming in. And so we found that input that's coming into our central nervous system or to our, excuse me, to our nervous system is going to include stuff that's in the external environment. That's the environment around us, in this room, right, when you go out to your car, what's outside, right? And then also your internal environment. What's happening in there? What's going on, all right? When you have stretch in certain organs, for example, your stomach, when you start to eat, that'll put stretch on the walls of the stomach. Going to start certain digestive properties or processes. Okay, so we're going to see all right all the different types of of uh, receptors in that situation. Okay, so everything has to start with the stimulus. Okay, we need a stimulus to start the ball rolling. All right, for our special senses. All right, to monitor and then interact with something, okay? So we start off with the stimulus. Keep in mind that that stimulus has to be receptor specific, okay? That means, and I said this last class, okay, the photoreceptors in your eye cannot pick up on sound waves. They're not designed for that, okay? They need light, all right? Color, okay? The intensity of light and movement, all right? So it has to be receptor specific. So certain receptors are designed to pick up certain stimuli, right? So what we're going to see now is that the receptors are going to monitor something and sense something, but what they need to do after they detect whatever the stimulus was, they need to convert that information into an electrical signal, an action potential. And that's what transducers do. Okay, so we're going to uh, convert all right, whatever that stimulus is, if it's sound waves, all right, if it's light rays or photons from the light, we're going to convert that stimulus energy into electrical energy, main, namely an action potential. Okay, an action potential. And that's what we're going to see here. That's what these transducers will do. All right, and some of those transducers are going to. Um, actually involve certain gates, okay? So what we'll see is with these transducers, we've already learned about the resting membrane potential, and it varies depending on which type of receptor we're talking about, okay? Um, so we're going to alter that resting membrane potential to create an action potential, and that is going to involve, all right, gated channels. And when I say modality gated channels, well, is it a chemical? Gated channel? Is it an electrical gated channel? All right, is it a pressure gated channel? That's what we're talking about here when we refer to modality gated channels. Okay? So we are going to then create these action potentials and we're going to send them to our central nervous system to figure out what the heck is going on. Interpret it. See what it is. What are we looking at? What are we seeing? What are we hearing? What are we tasting? What are we touching? All right? Or How's my equilibrium? Am I keeping my balance? Okay, so we get to talk about all that fun stuff. All right, so when we're talking about our receptors here, okay, I want you to understand that the receptors are going to send information to the central nervous system via sensory neurons. We already know that, right? Sensory neurons carry that sensory input information to the central nervous system. Okay, so we know this. Right. So where is that sensory information coming from? Okay, from the periphery somewhere, either external or internal environment. All right. So we're going to have this receptive field, and basically, okay, the receptive segment of our neuron is going to cover a specific area. Now, if it's vision, all right, the receptor field is going to be your visual field, what you can see. Okay. If it's touch, like the example that's given here. All right, we're going to have our receptive field has to do with the distribution area of where those nerve endings are in our skin, for example. 
So we know that the nerve endings in our fingers are much more sensitive than, let's say, the nerve endings around your belly button, okay, or on the back of your elbow, okay? So we'll see, all right, that if you have a smaller receptive area or field, you'll have more precision to locate where that sensory stimulus came from, okay? So basically, the more sensitive all right, an area is, and we saw that sensory homunculus, and we saw the structures that were pretty sensitive, sensitive your face, all right, your lips, all right, your fingers, and your hands. Those are going to have a lot of sensory nerve endings there, okay? So those areas are going to have a smaller receptive field, so we can localize where exactly the stimulus is occurring. And we do actually do a test like that. Neurologists will do a test to actually determine how, your, how sensitive your receptive field is. They'll use two sharp objects, okay? I'm using two pencils here. And what they'll do is they'll start, they'll press them close together. So almost both of those two separate points are one point, and they'll touch it on an area of your body, okay? They'll say, all right, tell me if you feel one or two pressure points. And people will say one, because you do it at the same time. And then they'll slowly move them further away. And some folks, it varies depending on where that receptive field is, but we call this discriminative touch, when you can differentiate, all right, the fine points and how many points of contact are being made. So if we have a very small receptive field, because we have a lot of sensory nerve endings there, all right, those two points will be really close together when, before they can say, okay, that's two points. In an area that has a small, or excuse me, a large receptive field, right, where the, you can't really tell, they'll have the two points further away before that person can discriminate between one and two uh, points of contact. So that's one way on how we can d differentiate or determine if we're dealing with a large receptive field or a small receptive field by doing that two-point discriminative uh, test there. All right, that first term there at the top of the page here, you need to know that, and I'll tell you why. Well, one, you'll see it on a test, all right? And two, all right, because there's a difference between a sense and a sensation, all right? A sensation is when we are consciously, you and I are now consciously aware of whatever the stimulus is, okay? It has come to our consciousness, which means it has reached all right, and has reached the cerebral cortex. If that sensory input never reaches the cerebral cortex, if it does not make it past the thalamus, remember our thalamus is our relay station, if it doesn't make it past the thalamus to the sensory cortex, all right, or the cerebral cortex, we will have no idea all right, what, about the presence of that stimulus, okay? So believe it or not, only a small number of sensory stimuli make it to the cerebral cortex, and for good reason. Okay, for example, right, when you first put your clothes on today, okay, you, as you were putting them on, you could feel them on your skin. But I guarantee you that you cannot feel every inch of that clothing on your body right now. You're not consciously aware of every bit of that. You know you're wearing clothes, all right, but over time, your body adapts to that. We'll talk about that concept, okay? So over time, that sensory stimuli isn't going to be making its journey up to your cerebral cortex. Right? I was told once by one of my neurology professors when I was in med school that if we were, if all the information came from our feet and ankles while we were walking, we would go insane. Because of all that sensory information that comes from the bottom of your feet, up to your cerebral cortex, or if it did make it all the way up to the cerebral cortex, you would be in massive amounts of pain, and there would be such sensory overload you wouldn't be able to handle it, okay? So we have ways to, to filter that out. Thank you, thalamus, all right? The thalamus will help to filter some of that information out so you're not losing your mind every time you take a step, okay? So we will see that a lot of this input goes to other areas of the brain, okay? For example, all right, heart rate, okay? We don't know when our heart rate changes from 55 beats a, a minute to uh, 60 beats a minute and vice versa, all right? Because that information goes to those uh, centers in the brainstem, all right? 
vasodilation and vasoconstriction of our blood vessels. Same thing. All right, we are not consciously aware, all right, of when our blood vessels undergo vasodilation. I can't tell when my afferent arterioles and the glomerulus of my kidneys are vasodilating or vasoconstricting due to changes in minute changes in my blood pressure. I don't know that. that information does come to the central nervous system, but guess what? It doesn't come up to the somatosensory cortex there. You're not aware of it, okay, for good reason. You got other things to, to you know, no pun intended, to, to put your mind to, okay? So keep that in mind. So when we talk about our receptors here and the central nervous uh, system information that arrives, all right, from the periphery due to a stimulus, we have these four things that we are going to discuss. Modality, location, intensity, and duration. Okay? Modality is what's the stimulus, right? Is it a light stimulus? Is it a sound stimulus? Is it, is it a touch stimulus, all right? Where is it happening, all right? How intense is it? Is it pretty mild? Is it moderate? Is it severe, all right? Or, and how, for, for how long? Okay, for how long? All right, so let's start off with modality. Okay, the type of stimulus. All right, we call it the labeled line. And so like I was saying before, the type of stimulus is going to go to a specific region of your brain, depending on what it is. Okay, if it's a touch stimulus, most likely it's going to go to the parietal lobe. If it's a visual stimulus, it's going to go to the occipital lobe. Okay, hearing temporal lobe. So basically, what we're saying here is, all right, your brain does not really know exactly what the stimulus is, all right, or that information, all right, until it arrives at the proper region in the cerebrum, okay? So the example that's given up there on the board is the brain interprets the optic nerve signals, all right, to the occipital lobe as visual. So it knows that when information is going to the, to the occipital lobe there, via the optic nerve and the optic tract and all those fun uh, structures that we'll talk about, okay, it then realizes that that's a visual stimuli, okay? Same thing we're talking about hearing when it goes to the temporal lobe, okay? And same thing when it comes to touch, when it goes to the parietal lobe, okay? So the next uh, characteristic of the receptors is the location. Where does the stimulus occur? Okay, is it inside? Is it outside? Right? And then we're going to determine, right, depending on what type of stimulus it is, right, the receptive field here. Okay? If it's a touch uh, uh, stimulus, a tactile stimulus, then we're going to pull in the postcentral gyrus there, right, the primary somatosensory cortex in our sensory homunculus and we'll figure out where it is because that information is going to travel to a specific region of that sensory homunculus. It's going to activate the, 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 the neurons there, all right, depending on where that is in the sensory homunculus, then we can locate, all right, where that stimulus is occurring, okay? Intensity of the stimulus, all right, is it mild? Is it moderate? Is it severe? That's all determined. We talk about this a little bit in chapter 12. Right? The frequency of action potentials that come down the neuron. Okay? The more frequent they are, the higher the intensity. Okay? The less frequent, the lower the intensity. Okay? Remember, action potentials are all or none. Once they happen, they happen. All right? So it doesn't matter. They're going to travel at the same speed every time. All right? Down the same neuron, I should say. As you know, myelinated neurons, all right, larger diameter neurons, all right, it will travel faster down, okay? But it's going to travel that same speed down that specific neuron every single time, okay? But if you start to shoot more frequent action potentials down that same neuron, all right, that will increase the intensity of whatever that stimulus is, all right? Cool? All right. Now... Let's talk about duration. And if we're going to talk about duration, then we're going to talk about this concept of adaptation. Okay? So when we talk about the duration of the stimulus, all right, we're going to determine how long, all right, because certain, certain uh, receptors can adapt 
all right, to certain stimuli and certain ones don't. All right, so what we'll see is with adaptation, it's the decreased sensitivity to a continuous stimulus. So you sitting there on your rear ends, all right, in those seats, all right, you have certain receptors in the skin, okay, in your gluteal region there, all right? And those are what we call phasic receptors, which means they adapt rapidly. You might not notice when you first sit down, you can feel it, especially if you first sit down and you feel something that's on your seat, then you can move it off. Right? But when you sit there over time, right, these phasic receptors adapt rapidly and you no longer notice right, or think about what you're sitting on. Okay? And so the only time that you would notice something there is, is if, if somebody like took a lighter and lit it under your seats, then you would feel the heat there. That's a new stimulus. So that would create, all right, a, a new response. All right, tonic receptors, all right, they have limited adaptation. So they're constantly, constantly uh, responding. All right, this is important when we're dealing with pain, okay? You don't want your pain receptors there, okay, to get used to the stimuli. That's bad, that's dangerous, okay? So you want these guys to not adapt. So when you have changes in that stimuli, whether or not it's um, uh, less intense or more intense, you want to be able to respond to it, okay? Um, for example, too, when we're talking about equilibrium, okay, we have those receptors in the inner ear. When we're dealing with balance and equilibrium, okay, don't want to be able to adapt to that, all right, because small little changes are important, okay, especially if you're trying to keep your balance and your equilibrium. So tonic receptors, excuse me, tonic receptors show limited adaptation, so they're going to make continuous responses to whatever the stimulus is, right? Keep in mind, it has to be a continuous stimulus. All right, phasic will adapt rapidly, all right, so they'll only respond to a new stimuli. For example, the pressure receptors, the baroreceptors, changes in your blood pressure, right? If it's constant, if the amount of blood, all right, doesn't change the volume of your blood and the pressure inside your, inside your vascular system doesn't change, that's fine, all right? It'll stay copacetic, all right? But if you increase the blood volume, you can increase the blood pressure, and that's a new stimuli, so the pressure receptors, the baroreceptors, will respond to that, and they'll make the necessary changes. So for a stimulus to be consciously perceived, the sensory input must be sent to what area of the brain? Cerebral cortex. Okay? That means it's got to get past the thalamus, from the thalamus up to the cerebral cortex. All right, questions about what I've covered so far? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so now I want to talk about how we classify some of our sensory receptors. And there's a couple of ways that we're going to classify the sensory receptors, all right? So first is where they're located, the distribution. Second is where the stimulus is coming from, all right? And third is what kind of stimulus is it, okay? So let's start off with the first one. All right, the distribution. Where are the receptors all right, found? And this is an easy way, at least for me, this is how I remembered it. Okay, let's go down to the second one here. Special sense receptors. Well, that's cool because that's what we're talking about in this chapter. Right, special senses. All right, all of these receptors all right, are, one, going to be complex sense organs, and two, they're going to be found in the head. Okay? So if you look down there at the five special senses, olfaction, smell, that's your nose, that's on your head, okay? Gustation, taste, that's, all right, down in your mouth, all right? Vision, eyes, that's in your head, all right? Auditory, that's going to be hearing, and then equilibrium, that's going to be your inner ear. So all of those are found in your head, okay? So keep that in mind. So those five special senses that we're discussing here, all right, are going to be head. All right, so now let's go to general sense receptors. Okay, they changed the icons out of here. Did you guys notice that? I did. I just noticed that. That's awful. 
right? So general sense receptors are going to be all over the body, also including the head, okay? So there's two types. So somatic sensory, well, we're familiar with that. That's the kind of stuff that we become consciously aware of, all right? So these are going to be tactile as touch. So those are touch receptors that are going to be found in your skin and then your mucous membranes, okay? Well, proprioceptors too. All right, and we remember what proprioceptors are because we ran into two of them when we were talking about our spinal reflexes. Remember the muscle spindles and the Golgi tendon organs? Those are two of uh, uh, proprioceptors, specialized proprioceptors, okay, for stretch and excessive contraction of muscles and tendons, okay? So remember, proprioceptors are going to include your joints. Well, what else do we find in joints? Muscles, tendons. All right. So somatic sensory receptors are touch receptors of the skin and the mucous membranes throughout your body. Okay, and then your proprioceptors. Now visceral sensory receptors. Okay, that's easy. To remember, visceral means organs. Okay, but these type of sensory receptors are going to be found in the walls of the internal organs of our body, and so they're going to monitor stretch, chemical environment, temperature, and pain. Okay, so those are how the first way that we classify our, our receptors, right, is going to be where we find them. Okay, so we have our general sense receptors that are throughout the whole body, right, and then we have our special senses, which are primarily, well, not primarily, they're going to be found in the head. Okay, so the next classification is going to be the origin, right? Where do these, uh, these stimuli come from? We talked about that way, way back in the beginning of the chapter, right? Is it, if it's outside the body, then the receptors are called exterior receptors, and they're going to pick up right, the information from the stimulus outside in the external environment, okay? So what's in contact with the external environment? Skin. Again, the mucous membranes, that's the whole point. Mucous membranes are going to be found in areas that have contact with the external environment, right? Mouth, nose anus, vagina, right? That's where we're going to find our mucous membrane. And then all our special sense receptors, okay? Those special sense receptors. Eyes, what do they do? They pick up vision outside, what we're looking at, outside of our body. Same thing with sound. We're doing it right now with you listening to me, all right? So keep that in mind. Our special sense receptors are exterior receptors. Interior receptors are going to be detecting our organs, stimuli going on in there, All right? So stretch on organ walls, chemical changes in the environment inside these organs, All right? Increase in temperature inside these organs. For example, the hypothalamus, when you get a fever, All right? And your body temperature is going to go up, All right? That's detected by the hypothalamus. All right, and then we have proprioceptors. Again, we know what it does. It's going to detect body and limb movements because we find these specialized receptors near the joints and also by the muscles and the ligament, excuse me, the muscles and the tendons of those joints. Okay? All right. Then the last classification method is going to be all right, what type of stimulus, the modality. Okay, so we have five types. Let me go through each of those. Hemoreceptors, thermoreceptors, photoreceptors, mechanoreceptors, and nociceptors. Okay, so the first one, chemo, chemical. So these are going to detect chemicals in fluids of your body. Okay, different fluids, digestive fluids, all right, fluid in your lymphatic system, fluid in your uh, circulatory system. All right. We'll also see when you're smelling things. We'll talk about that today. Remember, we talked about your um, olfactory neurons, and you have odorants, which are volatile molecules that when they come in contact, they're going to um, uh, create some sort of stimulus and change, all right, in the uh, hair cells of our olfactory cells. We'll talk about that. All right. Uh, thermoreceptors, again, temperature, okay? We'll see 
Changes in temperature, obviously in the skin. We talked about that in chapter one when I was talking about the negative feedback, and I just talked about the hypothalamus here. All right. When you have an infection of some sort, your cells will release certain chemicals into the bloodstream. Those chemicals will go throughout the body, one of which is going to be the hypothalamus. This, uh, they're called prostaglandins, specific type of prostaglandin, will stimulate all right, an increase in temperature all right, in the hypothalamus. Or it will stimulate the hypothalamus to increase your body temperature. Photoreceptors. Right? This is going to be for vision. There are three characteristics that photoreceptors can detect change in. How intense light is, the color of light, and actual movement. You need to know all three. Photoreceptors detect light intensity, the color of the light, and the movement. All right? And we find those on the inner neural layer of the eyeball there, the neural tunic, all right, specifically in the retina. All right, the last two receptors, mechanoreceptors and nociceptors. Mechano, mechano, excuse me, mechanoreceptors all right, are basically going to be for touch. But how do they do that? They detect any changes in the cell membrane or distortions of the cell membrane. Pretty clever, okay? So any type of change. So if you press on the cell membrane, it'll detect those changes there, that pressure. All right, and it will stimulate those receptors. So what does that include? All right, tactile senses like touch, pressure, vibration, and stretch. Okay, so these terms you've heard me mention before. Baroreceptors are going to be for pressure. All right, proprioceptors. All right, that's going to be for movement. All right, and stretch. Okay, what was our um, the uh, stretch reflex with the muscle spindle, we talked about that, okay? And then uh, tactile receptors, for, obviously, for touch. And then, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. oh, and uh, balance, okay? Specialized receptors of the inner ear. All right, one of my favorites are nociceptors. Pain, all right? Two types of nociceptors, all right, depending on whether you're consciously aware of something or not. All right, does not make a difference here. You, you will still come to the perception of pain. So somatic nociceptors, all right, are going to be found on the body surface, like throughout the skin or skeletal muscles. Visceral, obviously, is going to be the internal organs. Okay? You'll still perceive it as pain. You know, visceral, visceral nociceptors, all right, there's no point in, in <laughs> not being able to consciously perceive visceral pain, because that would be bad. If you couldn't feel pain in your organs, you could do a lot of damage to yourself. All right, so receptors on the tongue are classified into three receptor criteria. Okay? Now, the tongue is in the mouth, which is in the head, so it definitely falls under special sensors. Right? And the tongue... All right, is, or taste, I should say, because that's what it's, uh, we're referring to for the tongue, is the taste reception, gustation. All right, it is going to involve taking something from the external environment, like a piece of cake, like what I had for lunch today. I'm not proud of myself, but has anyone ever had the um, Brick Street Cafe uh, sweet potato cake? Is that not the best? Has anyone else had it? Have you ever tried it? Go, go there. You know where Brick Street Cafe is? It's across from the ball field, uh, floor field. Go over there. Get a cupcake. You don't have to get the whole cake, all right? But get a cupcake. It's good. I'm telling you, you don't know what you're missing. All right? And then it involves chemoreceptors. That's what your taste buds are, okay? Dissolved chemicals in the saliva there. Okay, so I want to talk about tactile receptors. We're going to talk about one of your uh, senses here, uh, touch. Tactile receptors are going to be discussed, and we're going to discuss mechanical. I keep saying that mechanoreceptors specifically. Okay, so you saw what mechanoreceptors um, are going to be able to monitor. Okay, touch, vibration, pressure. 
All right. So we're going to find these mechanoreceptors throughout your skin and then in the mucous membrane. So there's two types, encapsulated and unencapsulated. Now I'm going to apologize because for the next couple of minutes, what I'm going to discuss might be a little bit boring. All right. But I want to just move through these different types of receptors here, all right, where they're found and what they do. So we're going to start with the unencapsulated first. Okay. So if you're encapsulated, that means you have a covering on you. If you're unencapsulated, that means you don't have a covering on you. All right. So essentially, when we're discussing unencapsulated tactile receptors, we're just talking about the dendritic ends of a sensory neuron. Okay. It just kind of hangs out there. So the first type are the free nerve endings. Okay. So this is literally all right, the very tips or the ends of the dendrites there. Okay. Most commonly, these are going to be pain receptors, but also we'll use them for temperature as well. Okay? So they're very, very basic. And these are the ones that you are going to see that are going to be up in the epithelium. So they're going to be close to the surface of the skin. All right? And we'll also see it all right, quite a bit in the mucous membranes. Now, they can be phasic or tonic, which means they can either adapt all right, continuously, or they could be slow to adapt, okay? Your tonic are going to be the ones that are slow to adapt, all right? The phasic are going to be the ones that adapt quickly, okay? You need a new stimulus, all right, in order to trigger them to uh, send out an action potential again. All right, root hair plexuses, these are going to be found around our hair follicle, all right, so we know where the hair follicle is. It's in the dermis, all right, in the deeper layer of the dermis, okay, the reticular layer, okay? And basically, when your hair follicle shifts, all right, it's going to stimulate the hair, uh, the root hair plexus there, all right, and it's going to trigger a sensation of the hair being moved, okay? So it's phasic, all right? So every time the hair moves and it moves the hair follicle with it, all right, You'll, you'll get a sensory impulse from that, okay? So hair movement or hair displacement. All right, and then the last type of unencapsulated, all right, receptor is going to be the tactile discs, okay? When we were going over the epithelium, we talked about the three cells that we found in the stratum basal, all right, keratinocytes, melanocytes, and then our tactile cells, the Merkel cells, okay? So these guys are going to be found in the epithelium, the tactile cells. Well, the tactile discs attach to the tactile cell because when the tactile cell's plasma membrane is irritated or distorted, it releases neurotransmitter onto the tactile disc, all right? And then that will trigger a nerve impulse here. All right, so light touch is what these uh, structures are going to monitor. Again, they're tonic, all right, which means they're slow to adapt. Okay, so they're constantly, constantly um, sending information out. So you want to see a picture? I'll show you a picture. Here's a picture of all three. Okay, here you can see our free nerve endings literally. All right, we have all these dendrites here. All right, here is the root hair plexus wrapping around the hair follicle. And then here's our little Merkel cell, our tactile cell here. All right, when it gets distorted, it's going to release its chemicals here, neurotransmitter onto the tactile disc, which will then transmit the sensory impulse. All right, questions about that? All right. Booyah. Encapsulated. Now, there's a couple more encapsulated, all right, uh, receptors here, all right? In this case, when we're talking about an encapsulated tactile receptor, we're going to have a connective tissue covering, all right, <clears throat> that is going to be either, all right, glial cells, all right, so Schwann cells or neurolemocytes, all right, or some sort of connective tissue. So the first one here are the end bulbs or the Krauss bulbs. Okay, these are going to be in the dermis and mucous membranes, but what they detect are going to be pressure because they're deeper and some vibration, whether or not it's low or high uh, uh, pitch, uh, high frequency vibration, it's going to be vibration. Okay, 
These are also tonic, okay? Slow to adapt. We saw these before, the lamellated Pacinian corpuscles. That was the onion, the one that had all the layers, all right, wrapped around the end of that nerve, that receptor there, all right? So these are going to be down deep in the dermis, even in the subcutaneous layer or the hypodermis, and we'll also find it in some of the organs, all right? And again, they'll have deep pressure, okay? non-discriminative or coarse touch and high frequency vibration and these are phasic okay so they'll quickly adapt and so when a new stimulus arrives then they'll be triggered all right that's the lamelliated or pisidian corpuscles all right the next wait did i do that one yeah the next is going to be the raffini corpuscles or the bulbous corpuscles all right We'll find this in the dermis, in the subcutaneous layer, deep pressure, all right, tonic receptors. And then the last one are the tactile or Meisner corpuscles. We saw that when we were labeling the skin, all right. We're going to see those in those dermal papillae there. So they're going to be close to the epidermis, all right. Quite a few of these in some of the sensitive regions of our body. Well, some of the sensitive regions of the body are going to be your face, lips, hands, fingertips, and genitalia, okay? These are going to give us what we call the discriminative light touch, okay? When you can, um, folks that are blind, all right, that read Braille, all right, they have very, very refined Meisner corpuscles, all right? And they are phasic receptors, okay? So they will adapt quickly, all right, when they change the new stimuli there. All right, so here's a picture, all right? Here's our end bulb, the lamellated corpuscle that we saw in, in our chapter six. There's the bulbous corpuscle, and then our tactile and Meisner's corpuscle. That's the one that's in the dermal papillae that we saw also when we were in chapter six. Okay, I know that going over those things might not be incredibly exciting, but we got through it. Now, everybody likes referred pain. Well, nobody likes referred pain, but we like to talk about it, all right? You ever wonder why people come in and complain of when they're having a heart attack that their left arm goes numb and they have chest pain, okay, when it's their heart, or when somebody's having appendicitis, all right, and that they'll feel the pain right by the uh, uh, belly button, okay? So we're going to discuss that. That's what we call referred pain, all right? Referred pain is when your brain has a problem trying to figure out where the cause of the pain is coming from. And that is inaccurate localization, okay? It does not know where the source of the pain is coming from, all right? So is it coming from, all right, an organ, like your heart for a heart attack, all right? Or is it coming from the skin or the muscles of your left arm and chest, okay? That's what we're dealing with here, all right? It has a problem. Figuring out which is which. And the reason why is we'll see that somatic neurons and visceral neurons, all right, are going to share, all right, the same elevator up to the brain or the ascending track. So they'll jump in together. It's like you and three or four other people get on the elevator with you, all right? You're going to go to the same place, okay, but you're all different. You're coming from different areas, okay? So your somatosensory cortex is not quite sure as to the true origin of the pain, okay? So that's why we're seeing here, all right, here's the true origin. We're dealing with appendicitis here, all right? So you have an inflamed appendix, okay? And so the visceral neuron is sending information up to your central nervous system. Well, meanwhile, all right, the same um, let me backtrack. This, the visceral neuron is going to head to the spinal cord and go up to the brain stem on a specific ascending pathway. Meanwhile, it shares that ascending pathway with the same neur sensory neurons that come from the skin region of the umbilicus. Okay? So they're all going up in the same elevator, but they came from different areas here. 
So when it arrives up there to the somatosensory cortex, it has trouble differentiating, all right, where the true source of this issue is coming from because they all came together. All right, so a couple others here. There's the heart attack one I already talked about. Um, gallbladder pain. Has anyone ever had gallbladder pain? Cholecystectomy, if you have to have your gallbladder removed. Prior to having the gallbladder removed, sometimes people have an inflamed gallbladder. Most commonly, people with an inflamed gallbladder, it'll radiate pain to their right shoulder, okay? Um, it's only because, again, the gallbladder shares sensory innervation, all right, with those somatic sensory neurons that come from the right shoulder, and there's parts that even come from the back, all right? So when we see here, right, when we're talking about the heart attack pain, okay, Yes, you get chest pain and then left arm pain, all right? And that's because we are sharing the somatic uh, innervation from T1 through 5, all right? Those spinal nerves, all right, that innervate those regions of the arm, all right, are all going to jump together here, okay? So let me show you. Here we can see, all right, this referred pain chart. Here's a heart attack here on the left chest, all right, and along the left arm here, all right. Um, gallbladder, liver, they share the same because they're virtually from the same area. I mean, the gallbladder sits right on top of the liver here. So right shoulder pain and also right, let's say that's mid-back pain, okay. You can see all these varying areas here, all right, into where they're going to refer pain to, okay. All right, question about that? Referred pain. Has anyone ever heard of phantom limb pain before? Someone gets their arm chopped off or the leg chopped off, and they'll still get pain from that dismembered or ampu amputated area? All right, here's the thing. Even though you, let's just do the hand. Even though you took the hand away, okay? Remember what I said. Sensory neurons travel from the periphery up to the central nervous system. Well, the cell body of that sensory neuron is still living in the dorsal root ganglion or the posterior root ganglion, all right? So it's still going to be, oh, here it is. We'll use this one, all right? So here's that nerve. It's coming up. Its cell body still is here, even though we chopped off the hand way far away, all right? So what that will happen is, here we go, all right? What will happen is because that neuron in the cell body, well, that part of the neuron is still alive, it will sometimes send sensory input up to the somatosensory cortex, all right? And in some situations, all right, if we're stimulating the nociceptors, all right, because the nociceptors, all those, that, that wiring is still there, even though the actual origin of it is gone, the wiring is still there. And so that sensory information can still travel up to the brain, and the brain still thinks, all right, that whatever is lost is still present, all right? And in some cases, that pain can be excruciating. If you've ever worked in a VA hospital or known any VAs that have had loss of limbs, it's, it, can, it can get bad. All right. Let's talk about our first sense. Well, let's not talk about it. Let's review it because we already talked about it. Okay. So let's talk about olfaction. All right. This is a special sense. So when we deal with olfaction, okay, we are going to deal with chemoreceptors. Okay. Uh, and those chemoreceptors all right, are going to involve what we call odorants. So an odorant is a volatile molecule. And I say volatile because if you're a volatile molecule, you are a molecule that is very interactive. Okay? An inert molecule does not react with anything or interact with anything. Volatile molecules do. Okay? So what we'll see here all right, when we're talking about olfaction, it's going to start off here with an odorant that's going to come in contact with a specific chemoreceptor, okay, because we do have, not all, all right, olfactory cells can detect all smells. It doesn't work like that, all right? They're specific, all right? Specific 
olfactory cells can pick, can pick up specific scents, all right? So what will happen is our odorant will come into the nose, all right, and it will get stuck in the mucus membrane or the mucus layer that the mucus membrane has produced, and it'll dissolve. And there's special proteins there that will bind to that odorant, and then it'll escort the odorant, all right, to the olfactory receptor cells. All right, I'll talk about that in a second here, okay? Keep in mind, our sense of smell is pretty decent. I mean, we can distinguish between thousands of different odors. It's not as awesome as certain animals like dogs, for example. All right, theirs is pretty awesome, all right? But our sense of smell will obviously tell us, all right, information about food, especially if food's rotten, all right? So there is a survival uh, component to olfaction, all right? If you've ever seen the movie Jerry Maguire, all right, bees and dogs can smell fear. Did you know that? All right, it's a true thing. All right, just from pheromone production. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm just making that up. All right, but it gives us a lot. It gives us a lot of information, especially can, if you smell somebody and they smell mm, offensive or ripe. It can tell you something about their health. It does actually help you. And I mean, there's going to be times when you don't want to be around those people. I get that. Um, I'll get into some more here in a second here. All right, so let's first start to talk about the structures that are involved with olfaction. So we're going to start off with the olfactory epithelium. This is our sensory receptor organ, the epithelium as a whole, okay? We are going to find the epithelium in the top portion of the superior portion of your nasal cavity, okay? And there's three cells that are going to be found there. Now, this is important that you know this because well, from here on out, you're going to see, all right, the rule of threes continue, all right, especially when we, when we get into um, gustation, taste. We're going to have three cells. We'll have the taste bud cells, and then we'll have supporting cells and baby cells. Remember from lab, I said baby cells, bas excuse me, basal cells are baby cells, all right? They're just immature olfactory cells all right, that are going to be ready in about 40 to 60 days. So keep in mind, olfactory receptor cells are constantly recycling themselves. So every 40 to 60 days, you are going to have new ones, all right? It's just constantly rotating. Now, as we get older, all right, that diminishes, and that's why our sense of smell diminishes, okay? That's why grandpa can't smell his own farts, all right, because his olfactory cells all right, aren't turning over as much or as often, and he won't have as many, okay? Then we also have our supporting cells. Now, get, you look at the name of it, all right, you can guess what it does, all right? Its job, like the glial cells, help to support our neurons, all right? Supporting cells are going to help to sustain and support the receptors there, all right? The olfactory cells, their job is to, to detect the odors, smell the odors, see what's going on, okay? So there's those three cells that sit in the olfactory epithelium, okay? Just deep to the epithelium is the lamina propria, okay? That's going to be a loose connective tissue. And we're going to see in the lamina propria, all right, our vascular tissue, nerves, and olfactory glands, all right? And it's these olfactory glands that are going to produce the mucus, all right? We call them Bowman's glands, and they're going to produce the mucus that sits on top of the olfactory epithelium. Because remember, that mucus is going to allow the odorants to get one caught in, and they'll dissolve in that mucus, and then we can um, hopefully undergo some olfaction there. All right, let me show you. This, this picture should look familiar because we looked at it in lab. All right, so here you can see all right, here are the odorants coming from this cup of hot cocoa or coffee, traveling through the nasal cavity and moving up towards the superior region here where the olfactory epithelium is located. So now when we zoom in, you can see the outermost portion of this whole uh, uh, um, I don't know, this whole process or whatever, this whole this whole machinery. All right, is the mucus layer produced by the Bowman's glands here, all right? And the Bowman gland is going to be found in the lamina propria. So those odorant molecules get stuck in the mucus layer, all right? 
And while they're in there, they are going to um, interact with what we call the, the, uh, the, a binding protein. It's called an odorant binding protein. And that odorant binding protein is basically going to escort the uh, odorants to these little olfactory he here, hairs, excuse me, hairs, right? And these olfactory hairs are cilia, okay? And in the cilia is where we have our chemoreceptors. So the odorants will make contact, stimulate the chemoreceptors, and then will start to generate an action potential, all right? Causes depolarization throughout the olfactory cell, right? And then it goes down here through the axon up to the olfactory bulb here, okay? So here you can see the basal cells. Those are the baby cells, all right? And then our supporting cells in between the olfactory uh, uh, um, cells there. All right, so you saw that the olfactory cells are going to be bipolar. So a bipolar cell is, all right, you have the cell body in the center, and at one end you've got a dendrite, and at the other end you have the axon, okay? So the dendrite is going to be the end that's going to have the chemoreceptors, all right? Those chemoreceptors are going to be housed in the olfactory hairs. So your dendrite gives off these hairs, and in the hairs, all right, or the cilia, all right, that's where you're going to have those chemoreceptors, all right? And so those chemoreceptors are specific for specific types of odorants, okay? So if something is sweet-smelling, all right, those chemoreceptors need to be able to detect sweet-smelling, all right? If they only detect, all right, bitter, not bitter, that's a taste, um, I don't know how, what you would describe, a bold, all right, or a harsh sense, then those chemoreceptors won't be stimulated there, okay? So after our dendrite here, then we have our cell body, and then from the cell body comes the axon, all right? And so the axon is going to penetrate, all right? Our axon here is going to penetrate the cribriform plate. Remember the cribriform plate? All right, of the ethmoid bone. Okay, it's going to penetrate the cribriform plate, and now it's up into the cranial cavity. And just on the other side of the cribriform plate, we have our olfactory bulb, and that's where we're going to see, all right, some synapsing going on between the mitral and the tufted cells. All right, so the olfactory cell will synapse with mitral and tufted cells, and then those axons of the mitral and tufted cells will then extend back here. All right, here's the olfactory bulb. And then the axons of the mitral and tufted cells will make up the olfactory tract that sits here along the, in, in, excuse me, the inferior margin or portion of the frontal lobe. Okay, and you can see it's going to head back. Look at that. There's a the pituitary gland. So that's the cella turcica. All right, so you can kind of see the, the location and the approximation. This right here is the optic chiasm. That's where your optic nerve will uh, join and crisscross. Okay, so it's all very close to one another. All right. So that's where I get up here to the olfactory bulb here. That is going to be where we see, all right, the synapse of the olfactory nerves with the mitral and tufted cells here. And then from there, our olfactory tracts go back along the inferior portion of the frontal lobe and heads back to, all right, the temporal lobe because that is where your olfactory cortex is located, all right? We will have, all right, some interaction with the hypothalamus, the amygdala. All right, remember, the amygdala is part of which system? Feel free to yell it out. Limbic. That's right. <laughs> the limbic system. Emotions. Okay. But an important fact here is, remember I said this in lab, this is the only sensory pathway that does not project to the thalamus. I've seen that asked on tests before. Okay. Olfaction does not go to the thalamus. All 
All right. So do you mind? Oh, one other thing too on olfaction. All right. So after all right, the odorant binds on to these odorant binding proteins and then is carried towards the cilia there where the chemoreceptors are, all right, the odorant will then stimulate the chemoreceptors. And what will happen now is we will see, all right, the first time that you guys, uh, at least where I've mentioned this, uh, what we call the secondary messenger system occur, okay? Before, all right, we saw the prime, uh, uh, a different uh, system in, 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 in triggering certain cell functions to occur. Now you're seeing a brief introduction, excuse me, to the secondary messenger system, all right? So this is what happens, right, to, to trigger uh, so the cell, all right, to uh, depolarize. So what will happen is that odorant will stimulate the receptor on the outside of the cell. And once that receptor gets stimulated, all right, it will signal this special protein, what we call a G protein, on the inside of the cell to stimulate the activation of this enzyme, denylate cyclase. Okay? And what will happen is all right, that adenylate cyclase will, will convert ATP into what we call cyclic AMP. And so cyclic AMP will trigger, and there's a couple other reactions that occur through the secondary messenger system. You don't have to uh, worry about this too much, okay? But the cyclic AMP will open up these channels for sodium and calcium, making the inside of the cell more positive, causing depolarization, triggering an action potential, okay? I don't expect you to know all the details. All right, but this is an example of that secondary messenger system. Some, it's like, this is the best way for me to describe it to you. You're rich, you're living in a mansion. I'm coming over to deliver a message to you, okay? But you're otherwise preoccupied, okay? Taking a shower, going to the bathroom, doing something. So I knock on the front door. Your butler comes to the front door, and the butler says that you are preoccupied. You cannot take the message directly from me. I can then tell the butler the message, all right, on the outside. This guy is really rude, doesn't even let me in the house. So I have to shout my message through the door to the butler, and then the butler will carry the message to you, all right? That's kind of what we're seeing here. That's our secondary messenger system, all right? So you have, all right, that odorant molecule, which is going to stimulate this G protein receptor, all right, on the outside of the cell. And that G protein receptor will then stimulate and activate adenylate cyclase, right? It's this enzyme that sits right on the other side of the plasma membrane. That's the butler. And that adenylate cyclase will then activate or stimulate cyclic AMP to trigger the opening of these ion channels here, all right? There's a couple more steps involved, but that's just the, the short of it, all right? So once that happens, we depolarize the cell, all right, that stimuli is going to go all the way to the cerebral cortex, all right? So when it gets to the cerebral cortex, you can then, if you've smelled this smell before, you can identify the smell. Oh, all right, that's chicken noodle soup, all right? I've had that before. If it's the first time, you at least have some sort of perception of the cell, all right? During that whole process, too, we've managed to stimulate the hypothalamus. Remember, the hypothalamus plays a key role in a lot of activity in your body, one of which is autonomic nervous system stimulation. It's going to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system and cause it to stimulate your digestive system. That's why when you smell certain things, you ever wonder why you start to salivate? Okay, that's the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is stimulating all right, the autonomic nervous system, primarily, if you really want me to be specific, okay, fine, I will. It's going to primarily stimulate cranial nerves 5 and 9, okay? Se did I say 5 and 9? Excuse me. 7 and 9, facial and glossal pharyngeal. Those are the two nerves that stimulate your salivary glands, all right? Your parotid, your sublingual, and submandibular glands to start production of saliva. So now you get that visceral reaction to the smell, and then if you're like, ooh, you get excited, oh, I'm a little bit happy, it's because you're triggering the amygdala. The amygdala is part of your limbic system, and that's how you're going to get 
an emotional reaction. As long as it's intact, you'll be able to recognize the smell. If the amygdala is not intact, then you won't know what the heck you're smelling. Okay, because that has to do with memory. Okay, questions about any of that? Okay, this is all I'm going to cover today. What? I know. So um, we're going to stop here, okay? And then next class, we'll do taste, and we'll start vision. And then class after that, we'll wrap that up.